would you survive the zombie apocalypse? Imagine this, undead people roaming the streets. They're breaking into homes and ravaging cities. They want to eat human flesh and will seek it out fearlessly, without regards to injury or diplomacy. People have emptied out grocery stores and locked themselves indoors to hide. You don't know who you can trust. Could you keep yourself safe? How long until your resources run out? Let me walk you through my survival story, what I would do in this scenario, and maybe it will give you a few ideas to start preparing yourself. The origin of my survival plan comes from my summer job last year. The Doag Farm, a sustainable farm located on the property of the historic Woodlawn Mansion, was my stomping ground for 10 weeks. The Doag Farm consists of seven fields of rotating crops and a nearby greenhouse of sprouts. I worked here doing regular farm work, such as laying rows of tarp onto the ground, planting thousands of seeds, and harvesting squash. I loved seeing where food came from, what it took to grow, and how I could help feed families with my own hands. But when, for example, I had to hand weed row after row of lettuce, or when 650 feet of greens needed to be fertilized with what was essentially a backpack-sized spray bottle, this job was both physically demanding and pretty monotonous. To keep from getting bored, my coworkers and I played guessing games and asked each other thought-provoking questions. Our favorite was, what would you do if the zombies came? We all had the same answer. We would come to the farm. There was a well for water, solar panels for energy, some shelter. Plus, we could grow all the food we would ever need. The only thing left to do was to build some kind of barrier to keep us safe inside. But why does it matter? Why am I standing up here talking about some hypothetical epidemic of the living dead? OK, it's kind of crude, right? But farms are an incredibly important component of how we interact with the environment. Last year, using sustainable methods, the Doag Farm produced over 90,000 servings of vegetables. Assuming you need three servings of veggies a day, we would have had enough to sustain the vegetable needs of over 80 people every day, every year, for as long as the apocalypse lasted. If sustainability works on a small-scale farm, why can't it be applied to global agriculture? And it could be done so without amassing the serious environmental damages that large-scale global agriculture often produces. Every day that I planted seeds and weeded crops this summer, I thought about the choices that we on the Doag farm made to ensure that the way that we grew food could continue indefinitely. The same cannot be said for many large-scale agricultural efforts. For these, the cheapest and most efficient solutions to many problems often include environmentally degrading farming inputs, like fertilizers or pesticides. Over time, conventional agriculture requires more and more of these negative inputs to continue to be arable at all. The commercial food system now is scary to me. I see an unsustainable structure that must be changed. Farms that are run more sustainably are the answer. And we can model this change after processes that already exist. I was fascinated with the way that we dealt with pests on the Doag farm. The cabbage worm was a plump, lime green menace to our tomato plants. A singular, unnoticed worm could destroy plant after plant of our crops. Instead of just spraying some kind of chemical that would have killed any invading cabbage worms, we used a couple alternative and more sustainable methods for keeping our plants safe. If any of my coworkers or I spotted the signs of a cabbage worm, like a leafless branch on a tomato plant or small, squarish pieces of poop on the ground, we could most likely find, and then squish, the little invader. But we also got a few locals to help us out, including parasitic wasps. A female wasp will land on the back of the cabbage worm, slyly puncture its skin, and lay her eggs inside the body of the pest. From here, the baby larvae will fatten themselves on the inside of the cabbage worm. They'll eat it alive, until they're big enough to creep their way back out of the body of the cabbage worm and build their cocoons on the body of the pest. They'll continue to leach nutrients from the worm until it's dead. It's gross. <laughs> but it's also awesome for the sustainability of our farm and the surrounding ecosystem. By not spraying synthetic chemicals, we prevented a slew of negative repercussions, including, but not limited to, <laughs> OK, it might not be the zombies that get us but synthetic chemicals really do hurt the farm and the environment. Synthetic chemicals leach from the soil much more quickly than nutrients that were naturally there in the first place. And when they run off, they bring with them all the chemicals and nutrients that plants need to grow. They'll wash off into local water systems that pollute rivers and streams, 
And this can poison or mutate animals within these water habitats. They'll also make their way to the ocean, into our seafood supply, and onto our plates. You can see this happening now in the Gulf of Mexico, where nitrogen runoff from the Mississippi River has created a dead zone, a place where plants or animals can't survive, that's about the size of the state of New Jersey. This is dangerous for our seafood consumption, but also our agricultural production. Soil is one of, if need not, the most important parts of farming. A healthy soil is more tolerant to drought, better at holding on to carbon instead of releasing it into the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, and best at growing healthy plants. According to a study by the Rodale Institute, farmers who did not use synthetic chemicals saw corn yields that were 31% higher than conventional methods during years of drought. The choices that farmers make can not only impact their yearly yield, but better prepare them to deal with extreme weather events, such as drought or constant rain, like what we had on my farm this summer, that are coming more common today. The commercial food system is an incredibly entrenched and complex industry in this country. And I'm not denying many of its advantages. I appreciate being able to eat a mango here in Medford in February. And we all benefit from the safety net that ensures that if, for example, romaine lettuce becomes uneatable, there are other types of greens that we can presumably access. Realistically, small local farms can't completely replace large-scale agricultural production. They simply can't produce enough efficient output to feed, for example, all of Boston. But for now, the negative environmental impacts that come from our food system overwhelmingly come from larger scale agricultural systems. And they do so at a scale that's unsustainable. More sustainably run farms should be implemented and used to create better farming practices. As a consumer, you have more power than you might think. The agricultural industry in this country is at a crucial point of change. According to the 2012 USDA census, about 75% of established farmers are over the age of 55. And that was seven years ago. They're aging out of their work, and as they leave, they're bringing with them an entrenched way of interacting with the, the food system. This is our chance to create change. I'm sure you've heard countless ways to limit your environmental impact. Thinking critically about the food that you eat is another, even more important step that you should take. Your daily food choices are about more than just limiting your personal environmental impact. They're a way to call for and create a more sustainable food system. The two most common things that people say to me when I talk about the benefits of sustainably run farms are one, I don't even know where to get local food, and two, it's expensive. Let's talk about both of these points starting with access. The average meal in the US travels about 1,500 miles from farm to plate. That's the distance from here to Manhattan seven and a half times. You can find food that doesn't go on this carbon-heavy journey, choosing to shop at locations where your local, sustainable farmers will be selling their goods. Surrounding Tufts, there's a farmer's market almost every day of the week. But there are only three stop and shops in the same area. Locally grown food is available near you. It's just about going to the places that sell it. And it's really easy to figure out what those places are. You can pull out your phone and look them up. Farmers markets will be selling more environmentally friendly food. It's just about going to them. And what about cost? Food at farmers markets is generally more expensive, right? First, it's important to address the reality of food access in this country. Food inequality related to a lack of access for a variety of reasons, including geographic and socioeconomic barriers, is a serious problem in this country. It's a privilege to be able to consider and have choices in the food that we eat. With that truth in mind, I'd like you to consider what you're truly paying for when you buy food. Think about the potential cleanup costs of polluting local water habitats, depleting soil nutrients, and releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Conventional agriculture does not charge you for these externalities, even though there are enormous costs of this type of farming. I wish there were some concrete way for me to describe the actual quantifiable costs of degrading ecosystems. But how do you put a value on the existence of a pristine landscape or of a place's potential to sustain people indefinitely? I don't really know. And for now, no one is cleaning up or paying for the mess that comes from agricultural pollution, and the environment is worse off because of it. 
The cost of more sustainably grown food encompasses the cost of making environmentally friendly choices in food production. Your dollar is directly supporting systems that are more lasting. It might seem like you're buying the same squash for more money, but that's not the case at all. Instead, you're buying a, squ a squash that protects the environment, a squash that doesn't use synthetic chemicals, a squash that helps stop the zombies. Remember that menace of a worm that ate our plants in the Dogue farm? The cabbage worm doesn't really know what it's eating. It doesn't know where the tomato plant comes from or what it takes to appear in front of it. It doesn't know that as it's eating, it's destroying the thing that actually sustains it. The cabbage worm doesn't know any better, but we do. We can pinpoint exactly where our food comes from, what it takes to grow, and how it gets to us. We can see the effects of all of these processes, and we know that there's danger in many of them. We need to be more engaged with where our food comes from. The next time you need groceries, don't be the cabbage worm. Pull out your phone and look up what goes into the food that you're buying. You can talk to your farmers, they'll be at local markets, and they'll tell you about what goes into what you're eating. We don't have to be blind to the dangers of our food system. And knowing about the food that you eat is the first part of making the most sustainable choices. We have options that don't destroy our well-being. We have processes that don't incite the zombies. We can prevent the agricultural apocalypse. Thank you.